Um, yeah, we cannot control that everything, that's for sure. And in fact, actually uh, it's a blessing that we can't. Pathology. Because if you were yeah, able to get away get with fully controlling, controlling what your mind tells you you should control in order to live a happy really and successful life, you know, we would, would essentially plug ourselves into the matrix, that movie, or, you know, become kind of a, panic disorder a smiley face button. That. Yeah, we've got this cultural delusion I mean, that uh, you're having panic a powerful you're life functional. is a But numb. it turns out that panic is what you feel. I mean, when we you're produce it with our medications. Like, we try to produce it with our kind of same thing mindless with, uh, uh, of pursuits of, yes. uh, when you're not you know, kind of short-term distractions and so on. You're not willing to feel what you feel. Why? Why are we doing this? I really agree. the happy numb is not happy. Underneath depression is huge amount. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Eggshell Transformation, a podcast for intense people. My name is Imi, and I'm here with you on a journey. Today's episode is truly special. In today's conversation, I will talk to Stephen Hayes, PhD. Stephen is the developer of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, a popular evidence-based psychotherapy that uses mindfulness, acceptance, and value-based methods. He is Nevada Foundation Professor at the Department of Psychology, University of Nevada. And, and, and so author of 46 of books and level. over 600 so scientific articles, detailed, his popular you know, book, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, was featured in Time magazine. Dr. Hayes has been the president of several scientific is, societies and has received many really national want, awards, that's the one that, that including the Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Association for Behavioral it's and like Cognitive Therapy. Therapy. You don't have to be very careful in 1992, he was listed by the Institute for for scientific information as the 30th math. highest impact psychologist in the world. And Google Scholar lists him as amongst the most cited scholars in the world. This is an incredibly rich conversation mm -hmm. in which so you will hear what you can do if getting, CBT, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. doesn't work for you. Why panic is what way, you feel when you are trying not to feel anxious. And depression is what happens when you refuse to feel sad. As How you, you can gain them, real control you know, over your emotions uh, and why psychedelics help some people but not all. Finally, Stephen leads us through a guided exercise that you can do right like now. I am sure, sure you will enjoy Stephen's generosity and intelligence you know, as much as I do. Uh, now over, to the conversation. You sway, but you don't break. Hi, Stephen. Exactly. Thank you so much for being on. not move at all. very glad to be Absolutely. I would love to get to know more about you and the therapy that you have developed and the, amongst many other things. Sure. So we will talk about a wide range of topics, but I always like to start from you know, the guest's own story. Um, just to understand your personal experience, because I would imagine a lot of people probably put you on a pedestal and imagine that, oh, you know, that guy, he's mindful and solid he has never had any struggles so <laughs> it would be great to see what are some of the experiences that have brought you here and where you are today well actually the therapy work i do and the research work i do uh, mm -hmm. came out of my own personal struggles um i've always been pretty upfront about that but uh, haven't really fully detailed that story until uh, this new book i just finished called liberated mind where i walked through it in some details of my own struggle with panic uh, disorder and a bit about my own family history and things i saw in the home the, the domestic violence that was going on there and some pretty uh, sad uh, forms of addiction depression ocd and things like that so i've tried to tell that personal story because I think we come into the work that we do for reasons that have to do with our history and who we are and what we're up to. And that's for sure true with the acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT work. It's uh, really um, kind of an attempt to answer in my own life uh, a commitment uh, I made to myself long ago to do something about the suffering I saw in my own home. Absolutely. And, uh, and then soon enough, uh, found it inside my own life uh, to the point where, you know, it was really touch and go there for a while as to whether or not I was going to be able to even have a functional adult life. Mm. 
Um, so, uh, you know, when panic disorder really, really gets going, it's very, very hard to do the least little thing, mm -hmm. like uh, give, a, give a lecture or, uh, you, you know, prepare for your courses or just functioning as an mm -hmm. academic it certainly was hard. Um, you know, I think panic is what you feel when you are feeling anxious and you're trying not to. Uh, and discovering that it included that try not to part and that uh, you're essentially trying to run away from yourself and your own emotions, your own memories, yeah. your own bodily sensations, your own experiences. And then realizing that, uh, A, that doesn't work very well. B, you don't have to do it. I mean, it, it's uh, it's logical, it's reasonable, it's sensible, but it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially if you get into a kind of a, a mindless pursuit of uh, avoidance, as it begins to take away more and more of your life, the metaphor I, I use, it's like, uh, you know, finding a tiger in the kitchen and deciding that you'll just feed him some big stakes to pl placate him. Yeah, that's fine for now, but tomorrow it's uh, worse and the <laughs> next day it's worse and the next day it's worse. Absolutely. Yeah, and that is the base basis of ACT. And I think for a lot of people, it's a complete paradigm shift because I work with so many people who just want to get rid of their emotions, to get rid of their symptoms. Well, we're feeding that inside our culture massively, mm -hmm. and it's inside our minds anyway, because it's a, an, a simple extension of this evolutionarily recent thing of problem solving. Yeah. By a thousand times, it's more recent than the things that produce your emotional history. Mm. I mean, every organism that evolved since the Cambrian period, which is 545 million years ago, will associate painful experiences that occurred earlier with things that are occurring now, if there's any formal similarity, classical conditioning. Yes. Well, but what you and I are doing right now is a thousand times more recent. And so when we try to take this system and essentially demand of ourselves that we not have a physiology that will remind us of a painful past or connect us to uh, possible dangers or, you know, th things that we've experienced that were uh, sad or difficult. When we do that, we So you mean we can't control everything? <laughs> yeah, we cannot control everything, that's for sure. And in fact, uh, it's a blessing that we can't. Because if you were able to get away with fully controlling what your mind tells you you should control in order to live a happy and successful life, you know, we would essentially plug ourselves into the matrix, that movie, or, you know, become kind of a, a smiley face button. You know, I think we're stupid enough at our worst that we would, uh, you know, give away our capacity to feel. I mean, if you think about this, you know, like, like babies come into the world yearning how to feel. And that's one of the several things they yearn for. But it's the most natural thing for a baby to reach out and taste something, smell it, lick it, feel it, etc. Yeah, yeah. And when, yeah. when we get a little older, we have more complex emotions that we can do that with. And, you know, we pay good money for them. There's an emotion that you can name that you don't buy books or movies or songs or art or something mm. to produce that particular emotion. And yet what your mind does is it says... Yeah, I, I know how you can do it. Here's the way you'll solve this problem of feeling. Just feel good stuff. Well, then that takes you from how do I learn how to feel and learn from my emotions and turn it into, and how do I not feel this long list of very useful emotions, mm, which if you yeah. really do a good job of eliminating them, you now essentially are like a person without mm. a capacity to feel with their fingers or something. That's sure. They're not going to be more effective. If you don't have fingers, you can feel. You're not going to be able to do things that require feeling in the same way. You know, it just doesn't come packaged that way. What we have found in our research is that when people get committed to not feeling sad, anxious, or whatever, pretty soon they can't feel joy, happiness, mm. satisfaction. That's a really anxious, good point. Long. I have lots of people who comes to me and who, who come to me and say, I feel empty and numb and I can't feel connected to anyone yeah. or anything. There's no more passion. So I don't feel much pain. 
but I don't feel much joy. Yeah, we've got this cultural delusion that, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 a, uh, a powerful life is a numb life. Mm. I mean, we well, produce it with our yeah. medications. We try to produce it with our kind of mindless uh, pursuits of, uh, you know, kind of short distractions. distractions and so forth. And you go like, well, what? Why? Why are we doing this? Mm. Why do, why? I mean, the happy numb is not happy. No, no. Well said. Happy numb is not happy. And um, just pause this for a bit and go back to the beginning, actually. For you and your personal life, what was childhood like for you? Were you, were you, were you a child who that feels a lot? Were you quite yeah, sensitive? Yeah, I was a sensitive kid, I think. But, mm. you know, my parents were very loving and caring people, but they also were pretty disturbed in a way. And they got in their own way. And, and, and of course, at the time, it wasn't like you had therapists to go to. I mean, no. they didn't. They went and talked to their priest, you know. And uh, uh, so, you know, my dad was an alcoholic. My mom was OCD and depressed and they would mm. fight uh, mm. and, and in ways that sometimes were very uh, destructive and frightening. But mm. somewhere in there, I, I tell the story on a TED talk that I've, I've given of hiding under my bed as my dad has come home drunk and is, and, and they're in a, a knockdown drag out fight in the other room. And I'm hearing these loud crashes and I'm wondering, you know, is there going to be blood when I go out there? You know, yeah. it, is he hitting her? And, mm. uh, and my mom's shrieking at him. Um, For but, a child that has got to install a deep sense of helplessness. Well, I think what it does is it <clears throat> easily leads you to being sort of eight going on 38 and that, you mm. become hyper responsible and yes. you, you, you feel as though somehow you're uh, you're supposed to fix it number one but number two mm. that uh, if you're not taking care of yourself you you really might not survive absolutely and not I, just hyper responsible hyper vigilance yeah exactly exactly mm. so I think you know my childhood I, I think my parents had a you know they created a home that that included a loving atmosphere ironically it wasn't that it, they didn't know how to love but that also was one that produced uh in me um kind of a withdrawal into myself and uh, a hyper reliance on myself way too early so you know it just i'm i think what that does is that you don't do a very good job of playing you, you don't no. do a very good job of doing what kids need to do really to, mm. to kind of prepare. So I'm, to be I'm spontaneous awful. and plain exactly. playful and to risk spilling the milk, you know, and it, it probably has helped me with the uh, achievement. I mean, I, I work yeah. really hard out of that same, uh, you know, I'll just do it uh, mentality, but mm. uh, it's been harder on, uh, on me and on the people that I love, I think, because I'm, it, I'm a work in progress about being able to be more present and mm. open and vulnerable. And so love, luckily I have people who love me who, you know, see that I'm, they see the trajectory, mm. you know, they, they see that I do get better. <laughs> it's the work of a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. For those of us who are not too familiar with ACT, can you give us a brief introduction? What does ACT stand for? I know we have to say ACT rather than ACT. Yes. Well, <laughs> it, it always reminds me of ECT, and I'm, I'm old enough to have seen a lot of obsessions. <laughs> well, I'm young enough to not be traumatized by that association. It was, it mm. was traumatizing, really. Yeah. But, um, ACT is a collection of acceptance and mindfulness processes and commitment and uh, behavior change processes for the purpose of producing psychological flexibility. What psychological flexibility is, is being able to come into the present moment as a whole conscious human being with your feelings and their thoughts as they are, and to be able to sort of feel them and think them without becoming entangled or with them or dictated to by, by them or running away from them. 
and then being able to allocate your attention flexibly, fluidly, and voluntarily to the opportunities in the present moment to create uh, uh, patterns of action that are linked to chosen qualities of being and doing. In other words, creating values-based action habits. Yeah, ACT is a psychotherapy, but it's not just a psychotherapy. We call it acceptance and commitment training when it's being brought into business and industry or sports or uh, dealing with prejudice or stigma or helping people with the challenges of physical disease and so on. So it turns out that those flexibility processes uh, allow you to... um, manage your history, the current situation, and your behavior better than if you don't focus on them. And so, uh, you know, ACT is part of the evidence-based therapy movement. You you probably would say that it's loosely inside the cognitive and behavioral therapies, but it's not really a very specific protocol. It's not like, um, you know, this kind of therapy or that kind of therapy because of its breadth. It, it, It really is more a uh, collection of evidence-based processes that are central, it appears, to human functioning. Apart from it being a system of process or processes versus a, mm, a system of therapy, yeah. um, how is it different to the traditional CBT that is very popular nowadays? I mean, um, the NHS in England has rolled out a scheme um, in recent years to make it very, very accessible, well, sure. accessible, more accessible, and it's become something that many people are aware of and the golden standard for therapy, which I personally, you know, don't think is the only thing that works. And in fact, a lot of people struggle with it. Sure. Um, so I am interested in the uh, more the theoretical basis or the, the, the approach yeah. fundamentally, the backbone well, of it. you know, CBT is a family of therapies and it started in behavior therapy and then it added cognitive methods. Some of the processes that are inside traditional CBT, such as the focus on uh, destructive or irrational cognitions that need to be detected and challenged and disputed and changed. Turns out those processes are not really that central to the outcomes from CBT. What were more central then? Well, the behavioral methods, if you just did, if you look at this dismantling studies, you know, while it's a good thing to, to know what to do with cognition, it turns out that detect, challenge, dispute, and change is arguably inert in terms of the outcomes. In fact, some of the things that are focused on in cognition uh, from a CBT point of view produce uh, something more like cognitive flexibility of being able to step back and notice your thoughts, which is in there, it's in there in thought records and so forth as a beginning to then sort them into rational and irrational and and to correct them. Well, that last part is not all that important. There's a feature of it that might be, which is that you do want to be able to think in flexible ways. So it's really a little bit more like, well, in addition to thinking this, you could also think that, and you could also think that, and you could think that. Now, which of these things are most helpful to you? That's actually not a bad thing. But we're very close in traditional CBT. The traditional CBT folks do not want to do this, but we're very close uh, with with folks to uh, doing what actually can be harmful, which is to get focused on trying not to think certain things. Yeah, yeah. And so even though that's not the intent, any clinician who's seen people who have been to CBT therapists come back and say, you know, I, I've been doing it, but my thoughts haven't changed. You know, they're coming back again. I keep doing it. They keep coming back. You know, they're involved in some sort of mental war. And yeah. that's not helpful to people. Well, it turns out. Yeah. Well, we, we apply our guilt matrix and our own complex need to achieve onto this kind of mental processes. And we want to be a perfect machine yeah, where exactly. we only think clean thoughts. Exactly. And it, it's, it's logical, but it's not actually psychological. It's not helpful. Mm. And so there's features in there that I think, uh, you know, the more emotion focused therapies have an important point, the more relationship focused therapies have an important point. But what has happened over the last 15 years is that the mindfulness work has come into CVT and ACT was one of the early ones with a pretty mm. well-developed theory. And unlike I have to say it's a little prideful, but unlike 
uh, uh, some traditional forms of CBT, we had a basic science of cognition that we were working on called relational frame theory. And that gave us some advantages that mm. it wasn't just relying on a clinical theory of cognition. The, mm. the cognitive and behavioral traditions go all the way back to the animal learning tradition where you had these very sure. highly refined, basic behavioral principles. And they worked wonderfully until you get to what you and I are doing right now. And then they don't work very well. Different. What's different is this core conception of instead of trying to change the form of what you think and feel, we should focus more on the relationship between mm. ourselves and what we think and feel and how mm. to produce a relationship that's more open and flexible and that that's will empower beautiful. us to come into the present moment and do what yeah. matters. So not the thoughts content and not our feelings content, but our relationship to what emerges. Exactly. And mm. most of the new forms of CBT, I mean, not just out of the, the wing yeah. I'm out of. I mean, the mindfulness people for sure, but the metacognitive sure. therapy or DBT or uh, you know, act of course, but most of them have made that same kind of meta shift. Yeah, There's yeah. The relationship that's important. Absolutely, absolutely. So, be more precise about what you might say to someone who have intense emotions, and maybe they come to you and say, "You know what? I'm really sick of all these strong feelings that I have. I just want to keep them under control." And we talk about mood regulation in the clinical psychotherapy world. Um, but you have also said that attempts to regulate emotions can actually cause pathology. Yeah, we can easily get into the self-amplifying loops. And in fact, mm. people, when they've experienced really intense emotion, it would, of course you think emotion is a problem. Why wouldn't a panic disorder person think that anxiety is a problem? I mean, at the point at which you're having panic attacks, you're not that functional. But it turns out that panic is what you feel when you're not willing to feel anxious. Mm. And the same thing with uh, major bouts of depression. I yes. think when you're not willing to feel sad, when you're not willing to feel mad, when you're not willing to feel, you start feeling what you feel when you're not willing to feel, and we call it depression. I really agree. I mean, under like underneath depression, this huge amount of grief and anger. Yeah, and that so, has been suppressed. You know, when you have people who are struggling with really intense emotions, what I think is, yeah, of course, sometimes we're in situations where that comes directly, but often that comes through a combination of pretty painful experiences that we've had in our life that haven't been fully handled, plus trying to handle those emotional responses in ways that have actually artificially uh, amplified them into something that's overwhelming. And so can we find a way to, uh, you know, one step at a time, expand out our capacity to feel in a way that it, that it uh, allows us to both feel and to move forward. And, you know, if you take something like a mindful approach where there's a little sense of stepping back not in a defensive way but stepping mm -hmm. back so that you can see it in the same way that if yeah. you're standing in front of a painting only an inch away you wouldn't be able to see it you step back mm -hmm. so that you can see it there's a kind of sense of stepping back yeah and of opening up with an attitude of dispassionate curiosity like really watching the rise and fall or where it comes and when when does it go what does it actually feel like where in your body do you feel it yeah and you become curious about that. Well, emotions felt deliberately, like when you reach out and feel the table in front of you deliberately, you feel the little features of it. If you do the same thing with your own psychological emotions, you begin to gain, gain competence in feeling. We need to mm. learn how to feel. A skill that we can train, competence it's in feeling. It's a skill feelings. that we can train, absolutely. And, and, and it's it not will serve our interests. It does not serve our interests to be, you know, mindlessly chasing the happy numb. Yeah, yeah. And it's not about controlling them or suppressing all of them, but about having a better relationship with them. Exactly. And and mm -hmm. you know, it is true in some limited sense of the word control. Uh, you know, ironically, uh, people who've been through act, you know, one of the things we 
teach is to let go of conscious, deliberate, purposeful control where it doesn't belong. But what people then sometimes do, we even see it in our self-report measures, is they feel kind of a meta control because they realize that when I handle my emotions in this way that's more open and then that's less uh, this desperate attempt to try to make it be a particular form, yeah. I don't get overwhelmed. I can feel even really intense things and it's not going to kill me. It's actually going to help me in many ways. Yeah. And so that's like a space open up inside us to accommodate things. So exactly. we don't have to be scared of whatever comes up from inside of us. Exactly. And, and so there's kind of control at another level. It's letting go of the detailed, you know, is it a number nine or a number seven or did it happen here? Or happen? Let go of that. But the control instead how it lands in your life and how you stand with it. That is the kind of control I think people really want because that's the one that, that determines whether or not you're going to be able to live a life worth living. Mm -hmm. And that's what people are afraid of with emotions is that you're going to lose your ability to live a life worth living. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like a kind of control where you're constantly firefighting. It's a sort of, like you said, meta control and ability that you innately have. Yeah. It's like riding a bike. You don't have to be very careful and every moment think of how to put, place your legs. You just do it. I think that's it's a automatic. wonderful metaphor. And if you slowed mm -hmm. down somebody riding a bike, you would notice they're constantly falling out of balance. And then they adjust. And if, if you adjust, you don't put your face into the street. And so it isn't the problem that you're getting, you know, losing your balance. Riding a bike, bike includes that. And in the same way, emotions and thoughts will come up. That will knock you a little bit off balance. But if you have those skills, those kind of mindfulness and acceptance and awareness skills, as you notice them in a way that isn't uh, taking them to be literally what they say they are, running from them or getting all wrapped around them, you naturally come into the moment again. It's like finding your balance again. Sure. It also reminds me of the metaphor of a tree where, you know, when the wind swing, uh, blows exactly. over, you sway, but you don't break. Exactly. And if you try to just be rigid and not move at all, those trees you break. break. And, exactly. and, you know, some trees don't have the capacity to bend as much. And they're the ones that big storms dump limp. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can you give us, our, our audience, an actionable thing? Right now. Sure. Well, you know, there's scores of methods in each of these flexibility areas. And on this one of yearning to feel, you know, part of what I would do is, is maybe pick something where you have a sense that uh, this is not so overwhelming that, that you're going to run from it if you touch it, but you haven't yet fully opened up to it. And actually spend a little bit of a time uh, uh, bringing the emotion directly into uh, your life and taking time to feel it. I, if I can suggest one way to do that, kind of a fun way to do it, is I'll, I'll give you just a few questions. I won't do it at the pace you should do it yourself because it'll, it'll take too long. But you, if you actually have a, a little a phone or something, you can record these questions mm -hmm. and give yourself, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds between each one. I suppose my podcast audience can pause the podcast and process them. Sure. So the kind of thing, this is an example of a physicalizing exercise that's a classic act method. And so you focus in on an emotion that also involves maybe bodily sensations, some thoughts, some memories. It's kind of an amalgam. It's very rare that we just feel an emotion that comes in a package with little snippets of memories and bodily sensations and thoughts and judgments and sense of self and so forth. So pick something that your instinct is, this is something I want to do a better job of feeling and uh, it's not going to overwhelm me. So you don't leap into the deep end of the pool right away. Uh, no reason to push yourself. You're not a horse to be whipped. Uh, be kind to yourself and sure. take a little time to sort of, get in touch with that. I usually ask that people kind of reach inside themselves and metaphorically sort of put it on their lap where the it is this whole collections of thought, feeling, memory, bodily sensations, emotions that are in this area that you wanted to pick. And then I'm going to ask some odd questions. So if this were an object, how big would it be? And then allow your mind to 
answer that. And then if this had a speed, how fast would it go? If it had a color, what color would it be? If it had a shape, what shape would it be? If you could feel its surface texture, what would it feel like? If you could reach inside it, what does it feel like inside? If it could hold water, how much would it hold? If it had power, how powerful is it? And then when you've asked those questions, I have a second question to ask of you, which is, how do you feel towards this thing? And now if you have recorded it on the iPhone and, you're, and you've actually explored it, this thing that is of that size and color and shape and speed and power and texture, how do you feel about this? Like, especially if you've sensed any sense that it's something you have to defend yourself against or protect yourself against, watch out for that, or something where you're judging or pushing or wanting it to eliminate or go away. And if you did have that reaction, move this first one off to the side and now take your reaction to that first one and put it right out in front of you and go through those same set of questions. If it had a size, how big would it be? If it had a color, what color would it be? If it had a shape, what shape would it be? And so on. When you've done all that, the question I want to ask of you is, is it okay for you to have that experience, metaphorically of that size and shape and color and speed and all the rest? Can you let go of any sense of like, this has to change, this has to go away, this is unacceptable, some fundamental law of the universe is violated by me having an emotional reaction to this first one that has this shape and size and color? And if you can get there, look over at the first one and see if it's changed at all. And what often happens is as you open up to your reactions, judgments, etc., about that first one, the first one metaphorically starts changing its color or its size or its power or its speed. It starts telling you in ways that you can almost sense that it's okay to be felt. Yeah. Isn't so that's just a little example of uh, how to kind of, you know, I'm using cognition and a metaphor uh, to look at something. When we look at things, we naturally uh, don't feel judged by that, typically. You know, if you look at a door and it's a, painted very in a very ugly way, you don't feel like, oh my God, there's something wrong mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a thought within, you do. By bringing it out and looking at it and objectifying it. Just that alone gives you a little space. But then by bringing also your judgments and feelings and worries about the first one, doing that in a second order way, you can expand that space. Yeah, that's a really powerful exercise. And no, no, it, it, it absolutely formed the basis of how we can harness our relational skills with our internal landscape. Exactly. Yeah, I think if we, it's an example of, kind of learning how to feel. And if we use these exercises, not as a way of diminishing, regulating, eh, regulation's okay as a word, but regulation sometimes sounds like, you know, you're doing a math problem or something. And that's not what emotions are for. You're, you're not a math problem. You're more like a sunset. And so, yeah. you know, look at what's there with this sense of observing and describing, and opening up and noticing. We know how to do that. If you look at a sunset tonight, you for almost sure are not going to say, gee, it's a little bit too pink. It, it just won't occur to you. You might say something like, wow. And in that same way, if we can bring that wow mode of mind to our own emotions and thoughts, our own history and uh, bodily sensations, a space opens up where it's easier to be ourselves. Yeah. And from there, it's easier to create a life. Yeah. Yeah. This might feels like a slight change in direction, but um, what do you think is the role of spirituality in having emotional health and well-being? 
Well, I think it's fundamental. The very first thing I ever wrote about ACT in 1984 was called Making Sense of Spirituality. And mm. I, it was published in the journal Behaviorism, oddly, oddly enough. <laughs> because I'm a behaviorist and I, and I really thought, you know, that is a real challenge, you know, and, uh, mm. you know, I, I'm not here as a spiritual leader or religious leader and I'm not, I'm thinking just as a, a natural scientist here, here is a, you know, 98% of the human population says they've had spiritual experiences. So you, you need to address that. You need to touch that. And I think we've learned a lot about, uh, what those are. Um, you know, if you take measures of spiritual experiences, almost always they include these kind of senses of a, a different kind of awareness that goes across time, place, and people. You feel more connected or, or universal or, or one with others. You feel expansive across time or, or place. This kind of oceanic awareness and things of that kind. Uh, which might happen through all kinds of means. It can happen in meditation. I mean, the uh, you're looking at an old hippie, the psychedelic stuff, which is back now. You know, but that yeah, is definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's totally back. Totally back, and <laughs> and and hopefully we're not we're not going to be as stupid as we were the first time. But <laughs> but you know, indigenous people have been using those things forever to try to produce a kind of spiritual experience, and it's you know the data are pretty good. It can be actually transformational. We know even something about, and it's very interesting about how it happens neurobiologically, because it diminishes these midline structures that are central in this narrative sense of self, this, this conceptualized self, which, which has these terrible effects of dramatically filtering our, our sensory and sensory motor information that don't fit our conceptualization of ourselves. So we're living inside a world that's almost like a cartoon version of the world we live in, where our own kind of ego-based stories are so dominating they're even harnessing our underlying neurobiology to the point that we're not able to feel and see and sense and be with. We don't, just have, we don't have access to the information. So I think spirituality I view as central in being able to achieve a kind of sense of perspective and connection that is a place from which it's possible to be more open, aware, and actively engaged, to be more connected and loving and I mean, caring. You mentioned the psychedelics. Um, I know people can have an awakening experience through all sorts of vehicles. Um, sure. But that might just be a one-off experience. I think people probably need tools to then harness it and to really drill it in and practice. It's, it's a way of practice. It's a way of life. Yeah, I think we, th that's true. And, uh, you know, when the newer forms of psychedelic therapies, you know, uh, there's usually one or two uh, sessions that are kind of opening the door, but you, then you have to build it out in some way. This is not just done by a chemical. I mean, and so ACT is actually used by quite a number of the new, new wave psychedelic therapists because it fits so nicely with the uh, change processes when those things are helpful. Final few questions. What's your definition of resilience? Of resilience? Um, you know, I think it's uh, being able to uh, come into the situation with your whole history as it is mm. and to be able to orient you towards what the situation affords such that at the end of this next set of moments, your life is expanded. You're a little bigger, your version of who you are. And so I view it as a kind of a, a way of thinking about what does it take for a human being to grow psychologically? And I think that means something about being able to bring your history into the present, being able to connect with what the possibilities are in the present, yeah, and then being able to uh, care by choice, you know, to put things into your actual life moments, the things you do that are intrinsically valuable uh, because they reflect the kind of qualities that you want to put into your, uh, into your chosen uh, moments and into your behavior, into what you do. And, and that is what you call a values-based life. A values-based life, yeah. And so, yeah. 
psychological flexibility is essentially a resilience model. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and actually there's really good data that uh, if you are unable in these six areas of uh, cogn cognition, emotion, sense of self, attention, meaning, and behavior, if in these six areas you're inflexible, any one of them, and as you add more, it gets worse, mm. uh, you know, life's going to go in a negative direction. You're going to be less resilient. But yeah. as you learn to be, to be more cognitively and emotionally open or attentionally flexible and to have a sense of perspective that connects you with others, to be able to care by choice and to build habits of values-based action, as you do that, you create uh, flexibility skills that are useful to you. Mm in every area of life, whether it's relationships or work or, mm. you know, being able to uh, step up to the challenges of physical disease or, you know, yeah. lose weight or diet or exercise or, or win a gold medal at the Olympics. I mean, it, it literally, it's gone all those places and uh, yeah. we know it's helpful in all those uh, areas. Mm, sure. Can you share with us a book that has changed your life? Well, you know, uh, two, uh, I, I got into psychology because of the writings of Abraham Maslow, and I was really interested mm. in peak experiences, and I wanted, I wanted to have a psychology that could aspire to that, but that it was scientific in some way. And then the book that most changed my life uh, might surprise you, but mm -hmm. it's a, a utopian novel that B.F. Skinner wrote called Walden Two. Gosh. Of course, you, wrote his, you read his original text. Oh, sure. And it was, yeah. uh, you know, Walden II was, uh, became popular during the hippy-dippy days, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's an idea of a kind of a behavioral commune, essentially. Mm -hmm. I didn't view it as an answer to what we should do to be able to apply psychology to, you know, create a... a, a a, a way of being with each other so that would that would do a better job of raising our kids and you know of learning and achieving and so forth but uh, I view I, what I viewed it as was uh, an attempt to say this is a really good good question and so uh, to me it was really more like a Maslow book it was how do we create a psychology that can actually aspire mm -hmm. to foster the best of what we want to be sure. and i've kind of tried to live my life around that of, of trying to create a psychology that is uh, more worthy of the challenge of the human condition mm. good goal it's inspirational and aspirational yeah it's not the kind of goal anyone any person's going to achieve but sometimes it's good to have goals that are unachievable It may, may not be Absolutely. unachievable inside the culture. You know, I kind of mm. hope that there are they are achievable in the culture, you know, over time, over multiple lifetimes. Absolutely. But, you know, it's like caring about justice, like caring about, uh, you know, gender equity or, 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 you know, caring about doing something about racism or poverty or, you know. I have no doubt your drop in the ocean is a huge one. All of us. All and of it's, us. It's, it's good for us. It takes us out of our small egoic mind and think bigger and place ourselves accurately in the world and interconnectedness. Yeah, I think it's an it's an act of uh, of hope to do that. You know, because the the scientists tell you there's either enough dark matter that the uh, gravitational forces will eventually pull all the universe back into an infinitely dense pea from which it'll explode and happen all over again, or there isn't enough dark matter and it'll expand forever and ever until it gradually goes dark completely. Does either one of those sound very meaningful to you? No. And so science is constantly challenging us with knowledge of the world that basically suggests that uh, in the end, it's a big ice ball and that you really shouldn't care anyway. And, I, you know, I think it's kind of an act of courage to, to A, take that science and say, okay, and B, say, yeah, but while I'm alive, I do care. Yeah. You know, it's kind of 
sticking out your tongue at the fates. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and let's play at this game of, of that humanity, this journey that humanity's on of, you know, trying to create a more loving world. Sure. And that's worthy, isn't it? I think absolutely so. It's a worthy goal to live by for all of us. Finally, share with us a quote or a song or a poem that has inspired you. Well, I have a wonderful poem at the end of uh, Liberated Mind. Well, it's not mine, but I got permission from the person to use it. And uh, we have written permission, and she's been very kind. Her name is uh, uh, Julia Fehrenbacher, and she has a, uh, a website that uh, you can find uh, easily. And uh, she sells through her website, so do a favor to her and buy her book of poems. If you buy a liberated mind, there's a link in the back, but the poem is called hold out your hand. Hold out your hand. Let's forget the world for a while, fall back and back into the hush and holy of now. Are you listening? This breath invites you to write the first word of your new story. Your new story begins with this. You matter. You are needed, empty and naked, willing to say yes and yes and yes. Do you see the sun shines day after day, whether you have faith or not? The sparrows continue to sing their song even when you forget to sing yours. Stop asking, am I good enough? Ask only, am I showing up with love? Life is not a straight line. It's a downpouring of gifts. Please hold out your hand. Wow. That is really powerful. That's the final page of a liberated mind. And I was so blessed that uh, she allowed me to use the poem. And mm. uh, it really summarizes. Uh, it really does. I was really struck by the, um, I can't quote it exactly, but <laughs> the bit about, you know, stop asking, am I good enough? But asking, is my love enough? Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Um, yes, definitely give her a ping, and I would love to get her on, actually. Mm. Awesome. Yes, she's really, really good. And her poems uh, are, are lovely. That is, it isn't just a one and done. She's, uh... Stephen, what's the, what are you the most excited and curious about Great. right now? I know you have a book out, A Liberated Mind. Um, so give our audience a bit of a bleep and tell us where to find you. Yeah, I'm excited about The Liberated Mind because it's the first attempt to put the entire story of psychological flexibility, the science story, my personal story, into a book that you can give to anybody. It isn't, it, yeah, it has self-help features to it, but it's really more kind of a think book and a book that is meant to just uplift people in whatever kind of lives they're, they're living. And, you know, it's part of a piece. What I'm trying to do, I'm 71 years old. And you, know, you get of an age, you, you start thinking of not so much, uh, uh, you know, uh, do I have enough time for this project or whatever. You start thinking, what do I want to do in the time I have? And part of what I want to do is to bring together these worlds of uh, spirituality and of yearning for these deeper human emotions and so forth on the one hand with Western science and psychotherapy on the other hand. And I've been doing it inside uh, a process based approach. Can I dig down to the processes that liberate people and put them into systems? More recently I've been writing a lot and exploring the implications of an extended evolutionary synthesis. And I have a book that came out even after Liberated Mind. It's only been out a little more than a month, but I already had another book come out called Pro Social 
that links ACT and uh, Lynn Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning design principles. She won the Nobel in economics for showing that uh, indigenous people can protect their forests and lakes and rivers and streams, very relevant to the climate crisis kind of situation, and become more cooperative by by building groups that reflect what we know about how evolutionary principles work. And we've combined ACT yeah. plus her principles in this book called Pro-Social. So that's kind of what I want to do is I want to try to make some connections. Because in the same way that, you know, the, a guy long ago as a high school student reading Maslow and then as a college student reading B.F. Skinner, I thought, man, maybe I could square this circle of putting together these, you know, very geeky, basic science types, you know, the animal learning people and so forth with the people who are aspiring to peak experiences. And uh, I've been on that journey for the uh, most of my professional life and, and now I'm at a point where there's enough studies and enough things out there that you can actually make some connections. Uh, in a liberated mind, I do it inside the act yeah. work and in the book Pro Social, extending that out to, uh, you know, other people who are looking at social change processes that might produce more cooperation in small groups, which is mm. what I think is going to need to happen in the world for us to step up to the political and economic and environmental challenges we face. You've come full circle, only in a much more rich and expanded way. Yeah, it has been uh, yeah. an exciting journey yeah. to do that. A wild ride and a rich life. Wow. It's absolutely an honor to get to know you, to hear your story and to hear your thoughts. Um, I feel a little bit expanded. Thank you for that. It's been a wonderful conversation. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. For more, please head to eggshelltherapy.com. There you will find more stories, articles, and resources for people just like me and you. Bye now! Keep putting one foot in front of the other Moving forwards, never looking back Just one more foot in front of all those countless others And we're there